I'm going to give a little explanation about DNA bases in terms of chapter 7. It's also relevant to chapters 2 and 3. Um, the book does a fairly good job about explaining these matters, but I wanted to go to a little more detail, and I won't repeat the book here very much. So if you look at the structures in the top row here, I have free bases. So this is adenine, which we usually abbreviate with an A. This is cytosine, abbreviate single letter code of C. This is guanine, a G. This is um, thymine and its close relative uracil here, the difference being this methyl group at the five carbon. These free bases are, uh, occur only after we would have hydrolyzed the DNA or RNA, but we can study them to help understand how DNA, uh, DNA structure and how mutation occurs. So looking at these, these are all heterocyclic compounds. They're all aromatic. They're all planar. So we can look at these and recognize that this nitrogen here is a nitrogen which is f connected to the glycosyl bond to ribose or deoxyribose. In this, remember, this is a planar molecule, so it's all conjugated, it's conjugated, delocalized. We have electronegative nitrogen here. There's a lone pair here that's capable of accept, accepting hydrogen bonds. This is an sp2 hybridized nitrogen. This nitrogen here, these hydrogens are situated about 120 degrees. These hydrogens being connected to nitrogen, which is electronegative, are capable of donating hydrogen bonds. This nitrogen is sp2, so there's a lone pair. We can infer must be there. This nitrogen here also is, has lone pairs in the plane available. So all of these hydrogen bond donors or acceptors are in the plane of the screen. Likewise for cytosine, uh, this is the nitrogen connected to the ribose or deoxyribose. This oxygen is sp2. It has lone pairs here and here, 120 degree, degrees capable of accepting hydrogen bonds. This nitrogen also capable of accepting hydrogen bonds. This nitrogen here at the four position has hydrogens capable of donating hydrogen bonds. Also, all of these hydrogen bond donors and acceptors are in the plane. That's true of all of these all hydrogen bond donors and acceptors in the plane. So we expect these bases to interact with each other largely in a planar way. And if they don't interact in the plane, they tend to stack up. They're capable of pi pi, pi uh, stacking. There's hydrophobic effects there, excluding water. And they tend to be stacked up. And if you look at the structures uh, described in the book of B-form DNA, A-form uh, helix, which is more typical of of RNA, and I have a model in my office if you'd like to see, uh, you see there's extensive base stacking. Uh, guanine here we see has at the one position has a hydrogen. This hydrogen is capable of donating a hydrogen bond. Here at the sixth position we have oxygen that has hydrogen bond, hydrogen uh, lone pairs capable of accepting hydrogen bonds. We have here at the two position a nitrogen and it has these hydrogens are oriented as so, capable of donating. Here's a lone pair here. And here at N7, that's also capable of accepting a hydrogen bond. And N9 here is the one connected to the ribose or deoxyribose. Thymine is, has two exocyclic oxygens, both are sp2, capable of accepting hydrogen bonds. It has a, a nitrogen at the three position. This is sticking out at this angle in the plane of the screen, capable of donating a hydrogen bond. At the five position here, it has a methyl group. Uh, and that's interesting for us for other reasons. No hydrogen bonding capability. And also there's a hydrogen here, no hydrogen bonding capability. And this nitrogen is connected to the ribose. 
a deoxyribose in this case only. Uracil, which is essentially the same for our purposes as thymine, except it's found usually in RNA, does not have the methyl group. And I, there's some discussion that I will tell you about what the likely uh, structure function relationship is between that methyl. But uracil is largely the same. We have sp2 uh, heavy atoms here, two lone pairs on oxygen, on each oxygen capable of accepting hydrogen bonds, and this hydrogen and the nitrogen capable of donating, and the glycyl bond here connects the nitrogen to ribose. So these heterocyclic bases are planar, aromatic, the aromaticity makes them more chemically stable than they otherwise might be. All the hydrogen bond donors and acceptors are in the plane. So we're not surprised when we see nucleic acid structures that the hydrogen bond interactions between bases are in the plane. The typical hydrogen bond uh, bonds that are formed or the base pairs that are formed in standard normal DNA, which would be b form DNA, are of this sort of orientation. I intentionally chose a unnatural or a non-standard set of bases to emphasize this. The four up here are standard for DNA and in additionally we have uracil which is found in RNA. There are other bases found in DNA, though not very commonly. In RNA there are a lot of modified bases. I believe the count is maybe beyond 100 now. Extensive modifications. RNA structures quite a bit more complex a DNA structure. DNA's purpose, its function is to serve as genetic materials. Its function is to be replicated and to be transcribed. So it's not often very much modified, not very many modified bases in it, and it's usually in B form. It's there. As a result, the B form DNA has what we call Watson-Crick geometry, and that geometry is defined by what the polymerase incorporates. DNA polymerase copies a template DNA by inserting in the uh, deoxynucleotide triphosphate that fits. The book may explain it by hydrogen bonding that contributes, but the main issue is fits. If it doesn't fit in the right way, then the, then the catalytic step will not occur. What does fit mean? Well, fit means geometrically. So if this template or, or substrate, it doesn't matter. We have the glycosyl bond here, the glycosyl bond here. And if you look at this angle here, I guess I could extend it. And I could show you that this is almost 90 degrees. And this distance here between the glycosyl nitrogens is almost uh, 10 angstroms. So we have this Watson-Crick geometry. And if this geometry does not occur, then the correct substrate, the correct DNTP, will not be inserted opposite the template. And this Watson-Crick geometry is what makes DNA B form or RNA uh, RNA structures A form. It's a very regular. It doesn't matter which purine or pyrimidine pair it is, it's the same. I want you to be able to recognize this. I want you to be able to recognize the five standard bases. I want you to recognize I want you to recognize Watson Kirk geometry. I have here then so what I show here is a uracil and a diaminopurine to show you the hydrogen bonding that occurs. The geometry is so perfect that the hydrogen bonds align collinear with where the lone pair on the heavy atoms are. So it uh, fits very well. And it doesn't matter which pyrimidine and which purine, they have the same geometry. Even if we exchange these two, the relative positions of the glycosyl bonds and the angles. And this part forms the major groove. And this part here would be the minor groove. Most proteins that bind to DNA uh, will recognize hydrogen bond, specifically hydrogen bond donors and acceptors in the major group. Some small molecules recognize minor group. So I show here a uh, base, pyrimidine base, which does not occur naturally, uh, it's just for the case of nomenclature, and a purine. And so you can see what the arrangement is in a base pair. 
these will be oriented towards each other. There will be a substituent here, a substituent with base pairs, a substituent, a substituent with hydrogen bonding, substituent, uh, substituent, and the glycosyl bond will be here and here. So recognize that geometry. Let me show you further some examples. So this is a standard normal canonical base pair. There are then two possible base pairs. Here we have G C and here we have U which we can make it T if we want by simply adding that substituent. The substituent methyl on the uracil has some interesting aspects we discussed in class and its main function seems to be to designate it as a as a thymine so we can distinguish from deaminated cytosine and, and we'll talk about that. There's also methylated cytosine and there are, there are uh, non-standard bases that occur in DNA. The most likely one we will encounter is 5-methylcytosine and that's used as the epigenetic mark. And we have an adenine here. Notice that the geometry is the same. The angle here, the distance. The angle here, the distance. They're the same. However, there are other base pairs that can form, sometimes using the same hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, sometimes using other hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. And I'll give you some examples. There, I think, are identified about, let's see, last I remember, 31 possible or 31 observed base pairs in, in different structures. Usually these are RNA structures. RNA has all sorts of unusual structures, unusual twist to it. DNA is usually B form, standard, canonical, nothing but Watson Crick because it's made by polymerase, very regular structure. RNA, made as a single strand transcript, folds up into many unusual structures, lots of interesting biology there, and we have many different base pairs that are possible. In addition, we have many, many modified bases. I think the count may be above 80, maybe up to 100 of mo chemically modified bases that occur. Our interest in Chapter 7 is what is the normal geometry, what is the normal chemistry, so we can understand when chemical change does occur as a as the result of uh, a mutagen um, or a polymerase mistake, what that different base pair is, what that different damage is, how it affects base pairing, how it affects uh, the DNA as a template, how it interacts with repair processes, uh, repair enzymes and polymerase to cause a mutation. So what I have here, you see this is a guanine and this is a uracil and the base pair. This is not Watson Crick geometry. The angle is not so far off. The distance is not far off, but it's offset. This should be, this part should be down here, right? And this part should be down here and this should be down here. And this is what we call a wobble pair. This is found most commonly in a tRNA codon anticodon interaction and this is not uncommonly found in A form stems on RNA. It's not found, it is not found in B form DNA because the geometry is different. It is not Watson Crick. That's called a wobble pair. It's special. Here we have one and this is an adenine and this is a uracil. You say, aha, well that's a normal base pair. It's adenine and uracil. No, we see the glycosyl bond would be here and the other one here. So they're 180 degrees opposite each other while in a proper AU base pair the glycosyl bond would be here. So just because it's an AU pair doesn't mean it is Watson Crick. It is not Watson Crick. Here we have another example of an AU pair where something is very different and it doesn't even have the general look of it. So you can see there are many possible interactions. In this case, we have an N7 uh, interaction. We have many possible base pairs, and we will see those in some RNA structures, and they have important biology. But in B-form DNA, we don't. So please understand this relationship, because without understanding these relationships, it's very difficult to understand how mutations are caused. Mutations are caused by mistake of polymerase or repair enzyme. The first step is either DNA damage or a mistake by a polymerase. DNA damage followed by a polymerase not being able to correctly read what the template says 
or a DNA damage followed by repair. That repair may be uh, misrepaired or it may be repaired or removed, in which case a repair polymerase comes along and there can be a mistake. So there can be mistakes de novo by chance by polymerase or there can be mistakes as a result of DNA damage. This is why DNA damage is mutagenic and mutagenesis is carcinogenic.